Hey, welcome to Stream Erosion and River Systems. I'm Charlie Thompson, and let's take a look at this chapter. Here are the big concepts in this chapter. How are drainage basins organized? What unique landforms result from moving water? How do streams transport and deposit sediments? Uh, I start off with just some stupid uh, geography facts. So, the Amazon is the largest river in the world. And let's start with some basics. So, discharge is the term that we use to describe the amount of water flowing down a river. In every other country, it's cubic meters per second. In the United States, we use cubic feet per second. I'm going to use cubic meters per second. So the Amazon has 180,000 cubic meters per second. So the discharge of the Amazon, 180,000 cubic meters per second. A cubic meter of water weighs a ton. So you could just divide this by two and convert it to small cars. So that's like 90,000 small cars per second. The Sacramento at flood had the highest ever recorded was about 18,000 cubic meters per second, which is equal to the, to the average flow of the Mississippi. So the highest flow of the Sacramento, about 18,000 cubic meters per second, is equal to the average annual discharge of the Mississippi, and that's equal to a tenth of the Amazon. So the Sacramento River, at its highest flow ever, managed to put out a tenth of the average flow of the Amazon. The average flow, if you averaged out the flow over an entire year of the Sacramento River, is about 665 cubic meters per second. So some vocabulary terms. Fluvial is the word that we use that refers to stream-related processes. Fluvial geomorphology, for example, would be the geomorphology of stream-shaped stream landscapes. There's no definition of the difference between a river and a stream. You can use those words interchangeably. Same thing with creek. Hydrology is the study of water, circulation, distribution, and properties. So let's get into streams and drainage basins. So the basic unit, like I said, is a drainage basin. And the drainage basin is all the land that if rain falls on it, it's going to flow into whichever river you're talking about. So if this was the Sacramento River, this would be the Sacramento River drainage basin and all the rain that falls into this area would eventually end up in the Sacramento River. One of the cool things about drainage basins is they're hierarchically nested. So for example, the Sacramento, let's just pretend that this is the Sacramento River drainage basin, and you could have a tributary, a stream that flows into it, and that stream would be its own drainage basin. So for example, we could look at the American River drainage basin, which would be a subset of the Sacramento drainage basin, and then you could divide that basin, this sub-basin, into a sub-sub-basin. So you could look at, for example, just the north, the north fork of the American River would be a basin, a sub-basin of the American River, which would itself be a sub-basin of the Sacramento River. Drainage basins. Drainage basins are divided by drainage divides. So this ridge line that separates these two basins would be the drainage divide. Here's a figure 10.2, some of the major drainage basins in the United States. So we've got the Pacific drainage basin, all the rain except for the rain that falls in the Great Basin. It's going to work its way into the Colorado, the Columbia, the Sacramento, and eventually work its way into the Pacific Ocean. The Great Basin in right, right here, the Great Basin, is a region of internal drainage. So water streams flow in but they never flow out. The water just evaporates. Here's the Mississippi drainage basin, which drains a surprising amount of the country. All the rain that falls into these drainage sub-basins. So we've got the Mississippi. All of this would be the Mississippi, but then there's the Arkansas sub-basin, the Missouri River sub-basin, the Ohio River sub-basin, and all that drains into the Gulf of Mexico. This is a great map. This is showing everything in pink, is the Mississippi drainage basin or tributaries of the Mississippi. Here we have the Colorado drainage basin, the Sacramento drainage basin, the Columbia River drainage basin. Drainage patterns. 
Drainage patterns are important. That that refers to the shape of rivers. And one of the things as a geographer you can do is look at the shape of rivers. For example, this is dendritic drainage. It looks kind of like a tree. It's the most common form of drainage. There are ridge lines with high ground and then valleys with low ground. But there's an overall trend of, you can see there's a ridge line here. So everything that falls on this side is draining here. Everything that falls on this side is draining here. Just looking at the picture, I could tell you the slope is shallower over here. You've got dendritic drainage and the, the slope of this, uh, the whole slope is steeper here because this is parallel drainage. You can see that there's less forking, less branching. It's more direct and that's because it's much steeper. So rivers, given their chance, everything else being equal, they like to make dendritic drainage patterns. It's a very efficient shape. And if it's too steep, you end up with parallel drainage patterns. So just by looking at the shape of rivers, you have an idea of what the geology, the, what the geology is like underneath that river. So here we've got the drainage patterns from the book, dendritic. I mentioned that one. It's the most common form of drainage. Uh, overall high pattern at uh, the Sacramento largely has dendritic drainage. The Delta would be the low spot. And then the Sierras and the foothills and the coast range would all be high ground around it. Trellis drainage. You typically have these parallel streams with perpendicular streams connecting them. And that's formed in areas that have folded mountains like the Appalachians. In a little bit, we'll take a look at Google Earth and we'll look at, at what the landscape looks like and then how it creates those river patterns. Radial, I think, is one of the easiest to understand. There's a high, a central peak in this example, a volcano probably, and everything is just draining down slope around it. Parallel exists where the slopes are very steep. Rectangular tells you that faulting has happened. Nature doesn't have straight lines. Nature doesn't really have a lot of 90 degree bends that are abrupt. So if you see that, it's an indication that faulting is going on. Annular, very difficult to find examples of annular drainage. That's when you have an up, an up warped basin that's then eroded. Deranged is one of my favorites. Deranged drainage exists in areas where the topography is very flat. Typically, the only way you get deranged drainage is by having continental glaciation. So a sheet of ice literally hundreds of miles wide, hundreds of feet thick, scraping across the landscape grinding everything flat. So instead of, for example, the Sacramento River, where you have this overall pattern of high ground up by Redding, low ground in the Delta, everything here is flat. And as the, as the glacier melts away, it's going to leave random piles of ground up rock and dirt that are going to affect how streams flow. So not an overall pattern of high ground to low ground. The streams kind of wandered like they don't know where they're going like they're deranged. Also lots of swamps, they're poorly drained. And it's an indication that continental glaciation has gone on in that area. So again, here we've got that slide that started the drainage patterns. We've got dendritic on the left, parallel on the right. A close-up of dendritic drainage, that tree-like pattern, trellis, with those parallel lines. This is a cross section of the Appalachians showing how folded the mountains are. And this is the region that we'll be looking at in just a minute. Good example of trellis drainage. So you've got ridge lines with rivers flowing parallel to the ridge lines and the valleys between the ridges. And then every so often you have a stream that cuts across. Radial off of a central peak parallel where the slopes are very, very steep. Uh, we'll look at that in Northern California. There's some great examples of parallel drainage. Here we've got radial drainage again, flowing off of a volcano. Deranged in areas where the topography has been disrupt disrupted, for example, by continental glaciation. Rectangular, where there's folding, or rather, where there's faulting. Rectangular drainage is what you'd expect if there's been faulting. So rectangular drainage is what you would expect with faulting. And now let's take a look at Google Earth. So let's take a look first at radial drainage. Make that a little bigger. 
And here we've got Mount Shasta, and you can see that the streams are just flowing away from this central peak. Very nice, Mount Shasta, thank you. Parallel drainage, also in Northern California. We're gonna look over by Chico. And you can see here we've got some slopes that are very steep, creating these parallel drainage patterns. In fact, if you look at a map of California, you'll see that many of the county boundaries in Northern California follow these parallel drainages. Alpine, Nevada, for example, In Northern California, you'll notice that many of the county boundaries follow these, these parallel drainage patterns. If we were on the East Coast, we'd have a totally different tectonic situation. And here you can see folded mountains. You can see a very clear pattern of ridgeline. Here's a broad valley with a stream meandering back and forth across it. And so most of the rivers are going to be flowing down these, uh, down these valleys. However, every so often you have a stream that was flowing before there was the uplift. So for example, right here, there's a stream. Uh, the roads are following the streams, cutting across these, across these steep ridges. And that's an example of an antecedent stream. So the stream existed before the uplift before the uplift of the Appalachian Mountains. Here's another example. You can see this ridge line is, is bisected by this stream flowing across. Let's zoom in a little bit more. So the only way that this can happen then is for the stream to have existed before the uplift began. If we went up to Canada or the Northeastern United States, excellent examples of deranged drainage. So about a million lakes connected by streams with swampland in between, just lake and lake and swamp and swamp and swamp and lake and swamp. Annular drainage is very, very rare. Uh, in the book, there's an example. This is the only spot in the United States that I could find that's an example of annular drainage. So it's a dome, it's been lifted up and then eroded away, leaving these concentric rings of rock formations, and then the streams are going to follow those rock formations. But like I said, this is the only one I could find in the United States that looked legit. Let's go to the North Coast and take a look at a very small drainage basin. Oh, it's an excellent example of a drainage basin. So here's high ground, 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 high ground. That would be the boundary of the drainage basin. You can see the stream. You can also see a lot of, a lot of landslides, which tells us that this area is experiencing rapid uplift as a result of plate tectonics. And let's go to Stony Ford and take a look at I think one of one of the most amazing examples I've found of rectangular drainage. So if I zoom out a little bit, you can see where we are. So here's the Sutter Buttes, here's Redding and Red Bluff, Sacramento's down here. So you can see there's these streams coming out of the foothills, and then they make a series of right angle, right angle, right angle turns. As a result of tectonics with folding and faulting. All right, let's go back to the lecture slides. So let's talk about stream dynamics, the way streams actually flow. The overall pattern of a stream, the longitudinal profile is streams are steeper at the head where they begin. They are gentler and flatter at the mouth where they open out onto the ocean or a lake or something like that. So the overall pattern, it's concave and it gets steeper the farther inland you go. Base level. So rivers are powered by gravity. 
Ultimately, all rivers are powered by gravity, pulling everything to the center of the Earth. So rivers flow downhill until there's no more down. And globally, that is sea level. The global base level is sea level. Since rivers are powered by gravity, you could have a local base level of a reservoir behind a dam. And in fact, one of the issues in California across the American West is we've built all these reservoirs to store water. But then what happens is the ability of a river to transport sediment depends on its velocity. So if the river is traveling very quickly, it can transport large material. It can transport a lot of material. As the river slows down, if the river stops, for example, when it enters a reservoir, it stops flowing, it's no, long, no longer able to transport sediment. And so that sediment gets deposited in the reservoir, and then the reservoir fills up with sediment. Which is a problem, though, because the point of a reservoir is either you want to leave it empty so you can fill it, so that you can prevent flooding from happening in the winter, and then as the as the winter transition to transitions into spring, you're going to try to store as much water as possible so that you can use it for irrigation and hydroelectric generation in the summertime. But if it's filled with sediment, it's difficult to do that. So across the West, in California especially, we have an issue with sediment accumulation in reservoirs. And as a result of gold mining, it's even worse. I mean, we could just drain the reservoir, send in a bunch of dump trucks, scoop out all the sand, and you're back to back in business. However, because mercury was, mu was used in the gold mining process in California, many of these reservoirs have sediment that's contaminated with mercury, which causes nerve damage. So the best thing to do is just leave the mercury-tainted sediment on the bottom, covered up by safe dirt, and that way we don't need to worry about it, except then we don't have the space in the reservoirs for water. So it's a, it's a complex and difficult issue in California as the result of toxic chemicals being used in gold mining. So stream dynamics, let's go over some more definitions. Discharge, that's the volume of water moving past a point in a given unit of time. Uh, the rest of the world uses cubic meters per second. We use cubic feet per second. The equation for discharge, and we'll look at it later when we talk about flooding, Q is the variable that represents discharge. Discharge equals width times depth times velocity. Discharge equals the width of the stream times the depth of the stream times how fast that stream is flowing. So you have uh, the formula for discharge. Cubic meters per second, CMS in the rest of the world, cubic feet per second in the United States. So again, width times depth times velocity, Q equals WDV. More vocabulary terms, we've talked about these before. Perennial streams flow all year round. Intermittent streams flow for several weeks or months after it rains. They might have groundwater input. So even after it stops raining, you would expect an intermittent stream to continue for some time because it's using not just surface water, but also groundwater. And ephemeral streams only flow after it rains and they're not connected with rainwater. Uh, not connected with groundwater, I'm sorry. Let's try that again. Ephemeral streams only flow after it's raining because they're not connected to groundwater. So those are the streams that would flow for the, the most brief period of time. Exotic streams begin in an area with a moisture surplus and flow downstream into an area with a moisture deficit. The Colorado River is an exotic stream. The Nile in Africa is an exotic stream. The Nile starts in tropical rainforests in Central Africa and then flows north into the, the desert of Egypt. And some examples. This would be an ephemeral stream on the Susavli Plain in Namibia. And these features are called fairy circles. And I've included a link in the actual lecture slides to an article in the BBC about the origin of these fairy circles, because scientists aren't sure what causes them. They, they don't understand it. It is a poorly understood phenomenon. And an ephemeral stream. You can see there's almost no vegetation. It's completely dry. So after it rains, you might have streams for a bit, but then they're done. This is the Nile. It is an exotic stream. 
This is the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River and another example of an exotic stream. Let's talk about fluvial processes. What rivers actually do. Rivers erode material, they transport material. Through hydraulic action, the swirling water creates pressure and suction that helps pick up particles and transport them. Abrasion occurs when particles grind against rock in the stream. Water in a stream flows turbulently, randomly, in all kinds of different directions. It's not smooth, it's not linear. Laminar would be the opposite of turbulent flow. Streams. Streams have turbulent flow, streams don't have laminar flow. How streams transport sediment. So there's two terms. There's capacity, which refers to the total volume that a stream can transport. It's a function of discharge. The amount of water flowing down a stream is going to determine the total volume of material the stream can transport. Competence refers to the size, the largest material a stream can carry. Competence is going to be a function of velocity. So the faster the river is flowing, the larger the material it can carry. A slow-flowing stream could, could, could transport sand and silt, whereas a very fast stream could transport rocks and boulders. So this would be a high-velocity stream. The capacity would be high, but the competence would be low. So this would be a mountain stream. The capacity would be low, but the competence would be high. The competence, is it able to do it? Like if you're incompetent, you're unable to do whatever it is. So competence refers to the size of material, capacity is the volume. This would be low capacity, but high competence. As opposed to this river in New Guinea, this would be a high capacity. It's flowing slowly, but there's an enormous amount of water, so it could transport a large amount of very small material, but the competence would be very low. It's not going to move a boulder. It's not going to move a rock. It's not going to move anything larger than silt and sand. So we have these, these terms for the material that's transported by a stream. There's three types of sediment. I'll start with the largest material, and that's bed load. So the largest rocks are transported as bed load, and they either roll or slide or bounce in a mechanism called saltation. They bounce or roll or slide across the bottom, and that's bed load. The next smaller material is called suspended load. That would be sand and silt, little particles of dirt that are swirling around in the water. And then finally, the smallest material is actually dissolved and invisible, and that's called solution load. I think it's really interesting that in tropical rainforests, most of the load is solution load, that in the tropics, the rivers are rivers of liquid rock. The rock has been chemically weathered because of the high heat, high precipitation. So there's lots of chemical weathering. So the rivers are transporting lots and lots of dissolved rock in the form of solution load. As opposed to a mountain stream, you'd expect more bed load. Solution, suspended, and bed load. Uh, this is the modified Hillstrom diagram. I'm not going to test you on it, but across the side you can see the velocity and across the bottom the size of material. So as the velocity increases, the size of material, so at very low velocity you can transport clay. As the velocity increases, you can transport silt and sand and then pebbles and cobbles as a river flows faster and faster and faster. So, aggradation refers to sediment accumulating, being deposited and building up the bed of a stream. Alluvium is the term for material transported, deposited by running water. If there is a high amount of alluvium, often a braided channel is the river form. The Sacramento, the American, they're, they're, they all have main channels, just usually just the one main channel. But if the sediment load is too high, 
for the competence and capacity of a stream, then what you end up with is a braided channel. So this is the Brahmaputra River in India. It's an excellent example of a braided stream. Uh, the light blue color is because of rock flower in the water, that when a glacier, uh, a that when a glacier, a river of ice flows over the landscape, it, it grinds the rock down to powder. And then that's transported by streams and it makes it this light blue milky color called in German glacier milk. And the multiple channels are the way the river transports material. It's unable to transport material in a single channel and so it breaks up into a braided stream. So the combination of a braided stream and the light blue color of the water, both of those would tell you as a geographer, oh, this is probably glacial meltwater. If I, if I go upstream, I'm probably going to find a glacier. For example, the, the chapter opener is Iceland. If we were in class, I would have asked you a bunch of questions. Eventually, I would, I would have forced you to admit that it's got to be a, a uh, continental climate, a snowy forest climate, because there's no trees. I'm sorry, scratch that. So this is a braided stream in Iceland. If we were in lecture, we would have... This is a braided stream in Iceland. If we were in lecture, we would have spent some time discussing it. One of the things geographers like to do is figure out, where the, where the hell is this? What, what am I looking at? Where is this place? So it looks like there aren't trees. And that would tell me that it's a polar climate because even the microthermal climates have trees. So there's no trees and there's snow. So it's a polar climate and there's a braided stream. My guess would have been Iceland. As opposed to New Zealand, another braided stream in New Zealand. You can see there's snow. Again, that light blue color would tell you that this is probably glacial outwash. This is what you're, the water you're looking at used to be a glacier. Meandering refers to the side-to-side -side movement of rivers. So if you were flowing down a river and you could remove all the water, it would look like an asymmetrical half pipe for most of it. And the names of the banks have, or rather the each side of the river, the inside bank and the outside bank have special names. The outside bank is called the cut bank. Cut bank, cut bank, cut bank. The inside bank is called the point bar, point bar, point bar, point bar. And at the outside bank, that's where the fastest speed is in the river. The highest velocity is at the outside bank, so there's erosion. On the inside bank, that's where the river's traveling the slowest, and so there you're going to get deposition. And so there's this dynamic process by which a river will actually move sideways as it erodes the outbank, the cut bank, and deposits. So the width of the river stays the same because as there's erosion, there's deposition. So the width stays the same, but it, that river's going to move sideways back and forth across the floodplain. It'll move until it runs into something that it can't erode, and then it'll work its way back the other way in a process called meandering. So in the lecture slides and in the playlist of YouTube videos, I've got a great video on meandering processes. I think it does a really good job of explaining it much better than I can. So I'll just let you watch that. It's in the playlist. And let's take a look at the, the different parts of a river. So here we've got the cut bank, the point bar. And if you've spent any time on the river, you probably hang out at a point bar. People usually, let me back up too, people usually don't hang out at the cut bank because that's where the river's the fastest and that's where the bank is the steepest. So especially if you have small kids, they're going to fall in and be swept away. As opposed, to, as opposed to a point bar, that's where the sandbars are. That's where it would be nice to hang out. The water's traveling very slowly. It's shallow. It's safer. So if you spent any time at the river, you've probably spent a lot of time at a point bar rather than at the cut bank. So we've got point bar, point bar, and the river is going to be migrating outward in the direction of the cut bank. And as it does that, these bends are going to start to work their way towards each other until there's a cutoff. And now the river, the high velocity core of the river is going to flow through here. There's not going to be any flow through here. This is going to be slack, still water. So you'll get deposition, deposition. This will fill in with dirt. And then you'll get 
an oxbow lake, this semicircular lake that used to be part of, it used to be the main channel, but now the channel has moved and abandoned this oxbow lake. And then eventually over time, as vegetation dies, this will fill in with dirt, it'll fill in with dead vegetation, and then you'll get uh, a meander scar. And it, we'll, we'll look at that in a minute in uh, Northern California, up on the Sacramento River. So some slides, point bar, cut bank. You can see there's old trees, there's no trees. So this bank is working to the left. This bank is working to the right. Eventually they'll cut off, the river will flow through there, and then this will fill in with sediment. Another great cut bank, point bar. You can see, in fact, in these, in these pictures, I really like that the point bars all have sand and the cut banks are obviously steep. So as this process happens, there's going to be this dynamic pattern of very rapid meander migration where the river will move sideways very quickly. That's a function of the speed of the river. And then it'll slow down. So here's the Mississippi River. And if you're going from point A down river to point B, that would have taken you 48 kilometers. In the 1700s, there was a cutoff. This became an oxbow lake. And now instead of 48 kilometers, going from A to B is only nine kilometers. So you can see it's much steeper. So what's gonna happen is the river is gonna meander. It's gonna migrate very quickly. But as it does that, the distance from A to B is gonna get longer and longer. So the river is gonna travel more slowly and that meander migration will slow down, slow down until it cuts off again, then it'll happen very quickly all over again. And in fact, here is the Mississippi River in Louisiana. Here is, uh, here is the Sacramento River up in Cape Hay, up just, uh, this is Highway 32 going into Chico. And I've included a link, this will take you there in Google Earth. So if you click that, it'll open up Google Earth. And it'll drop you into Chico. So here you can see the Sacramento River. You can see point bars, point bars, cut bank, uh, this is a meander scar. 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 In fact, all the semicircular features that you see, that's a meander scar. That's a meander scar. These are all meander scars. That's a meander scar. Because Sacramento is drier, we don't really have a lot of oxbow lakes. They tend to fill in and dry out very quickly, but these are all meander scars, meander scars. Point Bar, that's a little bit of an oxbow lake there. And all up and down the upper reaches of the Sacramento. Sacramento in the upper reaches, there's a lovely example of a couple oxbow lakes. There's an oxbow lake. Oh, yeah, one of the terms for them is sloughs. So when you see people talking about sloughs, those are often abandoned abandoned meander channels. Oh yeah. So this is called Packer Lake and this is Packer Island. So at some point the Sacramento would have flowed up and around probably just after the cutoff, this would have been an island with water on all sides, but now it's sediment has filled it in, sediment has filled it in. And so it's no longer a lake. This is the Mississippi. And this is from the Fisk investigation, F-I-S-K, Fisk, in the 1940s. It was a, an expedition down the length of the Mississippi to study the past channels. So here's a color key based on ages of the channel. So we have the most recent going to the oldest channels here on the Mississippi. Changes in stream channels. Well, there's Nick points. And a nick point, waterfalls, a nick point is where there's a vertical break in the horizontal profile of a river. Waterfall, rapids, those are nick points. Waterfalls are just large stream nick points. Waterfalls migrate upstream. So here we have strong rock, weak rock, strong rock. What's going to happen is erosion is going to erode away the weak rock until the strong rock breaks 
and then it's going to erode back and the strong rock is going to break and it's going to erode back and the strong rock is going to break. So Niagara Falls, for example, is retreating, uh, retreating upstream into Canada, probably for the healthcare. So we've talked about stream erosion, where material is getting removed from someplace and getting transported. And now let's talk about stream deposition. So the material gets picked up, eroded, transported, and then deposited. Floodplains are an example of a depositional feature. Floodplains are formed by erosion, but the surfaces reflect deposition. So you could consider a floodplain a depositional feature inside of an erosional feature. Floodplains have natural levees. Uh, once we see the picture, it'll make more sense to talk about. So here we've got a typical stream uh, floodplain. Looks a lot like the Sacramento River where we were just looking at it. So this could be the Coast Range. This would be the Sierras and the upper Sacramento River. It's just going to go back and forth. There's natural levees that form every time the river floods. Because the ability of a river to transport material depends on the speed that the river is transporting, when the river slows down, it deposits material. So when a river floods, and I'll talk about this in a minute, when a river floods, it slows down and so it deposits material. Some of that material gets deposited in the stream itself, in the stream bed, and some of it, once the river has flooded and spread out, it's going to deposit that material right on the banks. And so every time a river floods, the levees get higher and higher and higher. The fact that the levees get higher, and so the banks of the river get higher every time it floods, can create these called Yazoo streams. So if this was a stream that would like to flow into this river, but it can't because it can't flow over the levees, it's a Yazoo stream. So you can see the Yazoo stream couldn't flow up and over here because there's levees, might be able to flow in here at some point. Also back swamps. So when the, when the river floods, the levees are often some of the highest parts in the floodplain. And so you'll have low-lying areas with poor drainage because the water can't go up and over the levee to go back into the river. Oxbow Lake, meander scars, meander scars, all of those are very common floodplain features. Okay, so now we've got a side view of levees, natural levees, and like I said, every time the river... Every time the river floods, it's going to deposit another layer of material. Here's a link to a YouTube video on levees and how they form as a result of flooding. People love to do agriculture in floodplains. There's water, there's fertile soil, what's not to like? Why not grow rice in the floodplain? There's water, it's flat, there's fertile soil. You could have paired alluvial terraces if the, the regime of the stream changes. If there's uplift, if there's tectonic uplift, you can get alluvial terraces. Okay, one of the important concepts is the ability of a river to transport material depends on its velocity. So the faster the river's flowing, the more material it can carry. The greater the discharge, the more material it can carry. The faster it's flowing, the larger material it can carry. And this can create features called alluvial fans in arid environments. Very similar to alluvial fans. So at the mouth of a canyon where there's a break in the gradient, so coming out of a very steep canyon into a flat valley, when the stream comes out into the valley, it slows down. When it slows down, it deposits sediment and it forms an alluvial fan. Same thing happens at the mouth of the river when it flows into the ocean, except we call that a delta. So when the river flows into the ocean, its velocity drops to zero, the sediment is also dropped, and so it builds up over time an alluvial fan. This is the Death Valley alluvial fan. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the Badwater alluvial fan. It's in Death Valley. I have included a link to Google Earth. which is part of the fun of these chapters, is that we're actually looking at features. Let's just zoom there. In fact, I'll just fix this in post.
So here I have a link to uh, this. This is the bad water alluvial fan. And let's take a look at it in Google Earth. So here we've got the bad water alluvial fan. You can see there's a very steep canyon here. The water comes barreling out of the canyon, hits this flat valley or flat, the flat valley. And the, as the water slows down, the stream can't transport that material, and so it deposits it. It makes this alluvial fan. Here's another alluvial fan. Here's another alluvial fan. In fact, if we turn around and look west across Death Valley, you can see these are called, this is a bahada. So this is an alluvial fan, this is an alluvial fan, this is another one, this is another one. You can see they're all coalescing together. They've all grown together, so you have this intermediate slope. Here's the playa. In fact, this right here is Badwater Basin. This is the lowest elevation in North America. It's 82 meters below sea level. And so you've got on the, on the west slope, you've got a Bahada coalesced alluvial fans. On the east side of Death Valley, you just have individual alluvial fans because the canyon is much smaller. So there's not, oh, linking it to earlier material, the drainage basin is smaller, so the streams are smaller. Over here on the west side, the drainage basins are larger, so they're capturing more water, so the streams are bigger. So you have an alluvial fan, a bajada, the coalesced alluvial fans. This is a playa, the dry lake beds, and this is an example of interior drainage. So when it rains, this is going to fill with water, the streams are going to run off into bad water, but then everything is just going to evaporate. And as long as we're here, we might as well take a look at some... Well, yeah, can you see the uh, Mississippi floodplain working its way down, as well as the tectonic region that's the black soils? So here we have the Mississippi Delta. It's a bird's foot delta. Some of the best deltas. In fact, the word delta comes from the Nile. The word delta, it refers to the Greek letter delta because it looks like a triangle. Get it? It's a delta. So here's the Nile Delta. You can see the fertile soil, the abundant water, all of it making life possible. In fact, the only places you see farming pretty much in this region right along the Nile. Here we've got the Nile Delta, the Ganges Delta, the Amazon Delta. Floodplains and human settlement. I mentioned people like to live in floodplains because there's good agriculture. That's the good news. The bad news is floodplains flood. So a flood, the definition of a flood, it's high water that overflows a natural bank. Uh, in fact, just before the flood, when the river is full from bank to bank, the technical term for that is bank full discharge. All one word, bank full. Uh, it's the amount of discharge that a stream can handle before it overflows. Flood hazards occur because millions of people live along floodplains because we love them. Underdeveloped regions are at higher, higher risk because a lack of zoning laws, a lack of enforcement of environmental laws. Floodplains, like I said, great to do agriculture, so rice growing is an excellent thing to do. Or examples of flooding. The Federal Emergency Management Agency looks at streams, looks at the elevation of land by streams, and determines their flood risk. A 10-year flood, the 10-year floodplain, means that there's a 10% chance, a 1 in 10. So there's a 1 in 10 chance of that flood occurring in any one year. A 100-year floodplain means that there is a 1 in 100 chance of a flood occurring in any one year. It doesn't mean that the floods are 10 years apart. It just means that there's a, for the 10-year floodplain, a 1 in 10 chance that that flood would happen. A 100-year flood, there's a 1 in 100. 500-year flood, 1 in 500 chance that in any one year they would have that flow. 
flooding becoming more common for a bunch of different reasons. Urbanization is part of it. More hard surfaces, the water can't soak in, it just runs off. Uh, climate change is making it worse. This is Texas. Texas, with Hurricane Harvey, broke rainfall records because the atmosphere is warmer. There's more water vapor. Because there's more water vapor, there's more rain. So cities that have figured out how to deal with floods in the past are finding themselves having to deal with unprecedented levels of water because of climate change. So, for example, in Sacramento, along Highway 80, Whenever we get big thunderstorms, Highway 80, the overpasses will flood because at some point an, en an engineer uh, had to sit down and figure out what's the most amount of water that this road would get? What's the most amount of water that this road would probably get? And then they have to design the roads to take care of, let's just say, two inches of water an hour. So if you have a, a storm where the flow is three inches of water falling from the sky, the river, the, I'm sorry, the roads just can't clear the water, and so you end up with flooding, even in places that had dealt with it before because of climate change. <laughs> in Sacramento... Sacramento's actually dealt with flooding, well, they eventually dealt with flooding really in an intelligent way. And that was, they said, well, the Sacramento River keeps flooding, so we're going to give it a good place to go. And that's the Yolo Bypass. So this is the dam. Uh, let's see, this is the Sacramento River. This is Highway 80 over, we're looking towards Ikea on the other side of the highway, on the other side of 80 is Ikea. This is Reed Road. Just over here, you can't see it, is the CHP Academy. So here we've got the Sacramento River, uh, some Oxbow Lakes, and then the Yolo Bypass. So here we've got the Sacramento Bypass, the Sacramento River, the Sacramento Bypass, and then right here is the Yolo Bypass. It's about three miles wide at the causeway. And the Yolo Bypass can handle about 600,000 cubic feet per second. The Sacramento River can handle about 400,000 cubic feet per second before it floods. The Yolo Bypass can actually handle more water than the Sacramento River. Up here is the Fremont Weir. It's a low spot in a wall, and when the river gets high enough, it overtops the wall and, and water starts to flow into the bypass. The Sacramento Bypass is controlled by a dam that they can remove before the city floods, and then they flood the Yolo Bypass. So farmers are given 24 hours notice to pick up their equipment, get their porta potties get their tractor before it gets flooded, which was a really great idea, much better than their previous ideas, which was to build higher and higher levees. Levees don't work to stop floods. Levees increase the length of time between floods, but levees don't stop floods. So here we've got, for example, Natomas, Natomas is, much of Natomas when it floods is going to be under about 15 feet of water. Once the levees break in a big flood and it's just a matter of time, that's the way it works with levees. Yeah, we never, never, never should have built in the, uh, in Natomas. This is a view of Sacramento. I think this is the 1865 flood, 1862, sorry, the 1862 flood, K Street from the levee. Uh, during this flood, they actually had to row the governor. Governor Stanford was rowed to his inauguration because everything was flooded. This was during the time, the time period when Sacramento was trying to deal with their flooding issues by building higher and higher levees, and it kept flooding and kept flooding and kept flooding. Eventually, they brought in wagon loads of dirt to Old Town and raised everything one story. So ground level in Old Town you're actually looking at the second story. The ground floor is buried and is now a basement. And that's it for chapter 10. Pretty brief, pretty straightforward. I hope you enjoy it. Good luck, and I, I hope you enjoy the chapter on rivers. That's it for chapter 10. I hope you check out the Google Earth links. I hope you check out the videos. I hope you enjoy the chapter on rivers.